Our uh, next speaker, uh, you heard him uh, at the family presentation earlier uh, with our uh, Worthington EMS folks, um, Dr. Michael Jolly. Uh, Dr. Jolly is uh, an interventional cardiologist and peripheral vascular specialist at Riverside Methodist Hospital. Uh, Dr. Jolly com completed medical school and internal medicine residency at uh, University of Texas Southwestern and his fellowship in cardiology at the eminent or preeminent Cleveland Clinic. Please uh, welcome Dr. Jolly. I just need a slide advancer. Oh, here it is. Okay, good. Well, thanks for hanging in there. I guess this is kind of late in the day and we're all playing hooky together, so this is the way it should be. Um, no one's saving lives today. Um, so I'm going to talk about acute venous thromboembolic disease. This is DVT and PE, okay? So we've kind of reached somewhat of a plateau in acute coronary syndrome, STEMI, NSTEMI. We're still evolving, but through the help of you guys, ERs, the hospital systems, um, we have dramatically impacted mortality and acute myocardial infarction over the past 30 years. Unfortunately, it's starting to plateau. We, we may be able to squeak a little bit more out of it, but uh, we've come a really long ways in over a short period of time. So now we're going to talk about PE and DVT, and this is kind of the, really the next frontier in my field because it turns out this actually kills a lot of people too. Um, the whole spectrum of venous intervention, which is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, involves PEs and DVTs and even chronic venous occlusion. We're going to talk about the first two in this short lecture. If what you know about venous disease is completely summarized on this slide, then I'm glad you're here. This is um, unfortunately where a lot of us get to in medical school and training. It's uh, anticoagulation and maybe a filter if you can't take anticoagulation and then good luck. That's really what I've been taught all the way through. This has changed. This is changing dramatically, and it's certainly changed, changing um, rapidly in my practice. At Ohio Health, and I work at Riverside, we do have a pretty comprehensive venous program, and this includes, of course, the management of acute PE, which is what you're often going to be integrally involved in, um, DVT, um, these uh, IVC filters, which you hear about on the news often, lawyer websites. Um, it turns out when these get put in and left in, uh, they're very challenging to get out. So we have a very complicated uh, retrieval program that we use. Um, we take care of superficial venous disease, some of my partners, and then patients with chronic venous occlusions. We recanalize these with a lot of stents as well. So I want to start with um, kind of the risk factors. This is an encompassing risk factor of what we call VTE, or chronic venous thromboembolic, or sorry, venous thromboembolic disease. These are gonna keep coming up over and over and over. And, and the questions I get up from a lot of first responders, paramedics, EMTs, is what can I do in the field of what should I be looking for? Well, keep in mind that over half of the patients that show up with one of these diagnoses um, have had three or more of these risk factors, okay? 48 hours of mobility. Um, this is something you're gonna be able to readily ascertain in the field. Um, a recent hospital admission. Maybe you've actually when picked this patient up before, you're picking them up again. Um, they've had recent surgery, they have a known active malignancy, they have an infection, they've been in the hospital. These things play out over and over and over again. Now there's a lot more risk factors, but I've kind of highlighted in red that the kind of the common recurrent themes that we tend to see. So the recent surgery, the immobility, we all know this. A prior history of VTE, this is one of the most predictive uh, risk factors for getting another one. Um, for young women on supplemental estrogen, maybe an 18-year-old just got put on birth control pill and now her leg's swollen up. Uh, we all know what that is. Um, and then obesity. Obesity is extremely prevalent, um, certainly here in central Ohio, but really anywhere, and this is a common risk factor for us. So let me jump into acute DVT. Now this isn't something that you're going to be rushing out to necessarily grab someone in the field for. But this is a very important clue that's going to kind of change our overall treatment paradigm when they get to the hospital. And this is largely going to come from your history. So patients will often have a painful limb. It's relatively acute on onset. It's not sudden often, like that might be a cold limb from an arterial occlusion, but maybe their calf's been hurting. It's been cramping for the last few days. Often they have unilateral leg swelling, but that's the most common. But they can actually have bilateral leg swelling too, depending on how high up the thrombus goes, difficult walking, an engorged, swollen, often purple limb. These are the kind of things we look for. So when we decide to treat these people, 
we're really trying to get to a few objectives. One is to prevent PE, because that's what actually kills patients. Um, we want to prevent the propagation of the clot. We'd like to restore patency in the vein if possible. Um, preserve valve function. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. To prevent what is a total di disease of misery, and that's post-thrombotic syndrome. And ideally in the future, prevent this from happening again, because it does happen to occur uh, commonly in these patients. One slide about post-thrombotic syndrome. This is what we never want to have to have, okay? You work in an acute disease field, you don't deal with this a lot, but these patients, more than any of the other patients I take care of, cardiogenic shock, acute STEMI, dying in front of us, CPR, these patients are the ones that will come give you a big hug in the office. The reason is because they live in wound care centers. They've had a PE or a DVT a long time ago. They have a venous ulcer that just won't heal. These are, these are patients that have a lifestyle of misery. Um, and it really is impacted depending on how extensive their clot was, how high up it went, how old the clot was, how you know, well or not well it was treated. We're trying to prevent this state. This is important. Um, all of your veins have little check flow valves in them. So if any of you guys have done plumbing, I mean, unlike your arteries, your veins are very floppy, but they have little valves because, of course, the veins are bringing blood back to your heart against gravity, and this prevents the reflux from going the wrong direction. And a DVT, when it isn't treated aggressively or appropriately, it turns into what we call a chronic DVT. A chronic DVT is not thrombus. A chronic DVT is actually scar tissue. And this is a opened up vein with a chronic DVT. And it really is just a web of nasty scar tissue that's recanalized. But this is an ineffective vein. It may have flow through it, but it is ineffective. This patient's going to have a swollen leg the rest of their life. Uh, best case scenario. The worst case scenario is they end up having a venous ulcer. So we really kind of gear our treatment to hopefully preventing some of this stuff. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, the deep veins, just to kind of reset what we're actually talking about for deep vein thrombosis, these are the veins that typically lie next to an artery that, of, a same, of a similar name. They're deep within the, the limb, um, uh, unlike the varicose veins and stuff that you kind of see on people. Those are superficial veins. Those can lead to deep vein thrombosis, but these are what we're talking about, the lighter shaded blue, if you can see that. These are your common femoral vein, your iliac veins, your, your, your what used to be called your superficial femoral vein, but it's actually just called your femoral vein now because it's not actually a superficial vein. Um, and then anything that has a similar name to artery. This is what we're talking about for deep vein thrombosis. And the way we kind of treat these has to do with how proximal it is, how high up it goes. The higher up it goes, um, the more it completely obstructs the outflow of the leg. So the leg has to drain all that blood back to the heart. And if the very top of the leg, which is where all that funnels into, is clotted off, then, then you have a much bigger problem. So for calf vein DVTs, just below the knee, they, they tend to not cause very, very significant symptoms. Um, they certainly don't usually result in any significant pulmonary embolism, um, and they don't really pose a huge risk for post-thrombotic syndrome. But as you kind of propagate up your leg into your thigh region, your fempop, or especially up into your pelvic veins, your iliofemoral veins, is your iliac and your femoral veins, your risk for an acute leg complication and PE go up uh, accordingly, and as does your risk of the more you know, chronic conditions. So the main complications for PE that we're looking for, of course, is PE because um, some DVTs end up in the lungs and they can cause a life-threatening situation. Of course, limb pain and swelling. And then the most catastrophic actual complication of DVT is called phlegmasia cerealid dolens. So phlegmasia is, is this. Phlegmasia is a painfully swollen leg, severely painful, often red, turgid, swollen, and, and what happens is you're actually pumping arterial blood into your leg, and there's nowhere for that blood to go. So it causes swelling, it eventually causes a compartment syndrome. It eventually, your venous pressure exceeds your arterial pressure, you lose pulses, and now you have a cold leg. This is a certainly a limb-threatening emergency, and if it's not treated, it's a life-threatening emergency. These patients can die from a DVT, so this is the one exception. We see this two or three times a year at our hospital, phlegmasia cerealid dolens. About 15 to anywhere from 12 to 50 percent rate of limb loss in this if it's not recognized. And unfortunately, these are often triaged to us as a cold arterial occlusion. And in fact, it's a venously congested leg, and the treatment is quite different. Um, a fempop bypass ain't going to help this, okay? This needs clot removed from the venous system. 
um, and revascularization is, is always indicated. So here's an example of what I would consider pre-phlegmasia. Healthy, 23-year-old woman, no past medical history. She ran a half marathon the day before, okay? Um, she's on oral contraception. It was just started. She does have a family history kind of remotely of, of venous thromboembolic disease. So she comes in with a painful, swollen left leg. She got a CT scan, and actually the CT scan is how the diagnosis was made. Typically, DVT is diagnosed on our ultrasound. It's cheap, it's portable. Um, the reason her leg is purple is it's congested with venous blood. Venous blood is purple, or certainly darker than arterial blood. And she just ran. She had a clot. She ran. So she has what we call venous claudication. She was running, 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 pumping all this extra arterial blood into her leg. There's nowhere for it to get out of there. And it led to this. So this is a catheter coming down, in her case, from the neck. Um, as you can see in the left-hand uh, panel there, um, you see a little remnant of the vein, but it's all that white stuff in the middle is thrombus. And I put a catheter through this. This video is not going to play, so I'm going to skip past it. And we ultimately were able to suck out most of that clot, lice it with clot busters, open the vein, and, and within eight hours, her leg returned to normal. This is a very dramatic, almost on the table kind of result of someone who is extremely unhappy, and this is very painful. So a great case. Here's a 36-year-old who came in with a right-sided iliofemoral DVT following a recent ankle sprain. There's almost always a little bit of history behind it. So recent ankle sprain was her immobility, okay? And she was um, on um, hormone, estrogen-containing birth control pills because she had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Unfortunately, she also carries a diagnosis of idiopathic thrombocytopenia, ITP, so her platelets live in the 40, 50,000 range. We don't love using thrombolysis in patients who have low platelets. We don't like using them for a lot of reasons, and this would be something we consider to be kind of a poor thrombolytic candidate. And in this case, uh, we used a more contemporary, modern, non-lytic-based uh, evacuation device. So on the left-hand panel, you can see that there's clot basically stopping off all flow coming out of her right leg, and it's seen again in the middle panel, and it's still on the, on the right panel there. That should be washing all the way up, and it's not. This is a demonstration graphically of what this device is. We typically insert this behind the knee in the popliteal vein. This catheter, we thread it up through the clot. It basically opens as a basket, a flexible kind of night and all basket that kind of grabs the clot. We literally kind of pull it out of a large tube called the sheath and express the clot outside of the body. Um, they never work as well as they do in the cartoons, but honestly, this device almost reaches it. It's very, very effective. Um, here's kind of an intravascular ultrasound picture of the clot. That's the right panel. So all that, uh, that kind of dense, um, sparkly stuff in the middle of, of uh, the catheter here is clot. Um, I'm going to skip forward. This is the device being pulled down. It's kind of entraining all that clot as it kind of panels, to, as it kind of... Uh, comes through the uh, thrombus there. We do a couple of runs here, I, I, and every time I take a picture, there's a little piece of clot there, so I come back and get it, and it's all completely cleaned out. It's demonstrated well by Ivis there, um, which is an ultrasound done from the inside of the vein. Um, it shows no more clot. This is, a, this is a fantastic result. Without the use of thrombolytics, this is the kind of very dense clot that's probably been existing in this patient's leg for some time. It's, it, it presents as an acute DVT, but realistically, this is clot that's probably been sitting in her leg for weeks, if not months. Um, and this is often what we see when we take care of DVTs. I'm going to quickly talk about IVC filters. Um, this isn't really going to be the scope of this talk, but I, I, would, I would tell you that there are a lot of different shapes and sizes of IVC filters. Um, for, for those of you who learned the term green-filled filter um, to be used generically to apply to all IVC filters, it's actually incorrect. There is a green filled filter, and it's the very top two that you see here. These are permanent filters. These were kind of the first ones, so they're kind of the prototypical. Um, but, um, you know, IVC filters have evolved over the years. We are really gradually moving away from IVC filters. They still have a place, but it's not the, it's not the, uh, the paradigm that we all thought it would be because we're really seeing a lot of downstream complications from IVC filter placement. In our practice, we do use them. We use them fairly infrequently, but we retrieve ni over 90% of the filters we put in. I would tell you the national average for taking out a retrievable filter is around 20 to 30%. So it's, it's heroically bad, okay? And they lead to a lot of, of, of problems. This, for those of you who have never seen a retrieval, I thought I would take the time to show you this. We go fishing. It's one of my favorite procedures to do because it's kind of fun. We grab the top of the hook and we take a little sheath and we capture it and collapse it into a sheath. We do this from a jugular vein. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to play a little game. The first one's very easy. 
If you know who this person is and it's written on the screen, um, go ahead and shout it out. David Bloom, very good. Anyone know who this is? He was a reporter of the news who, who drove around um, during the Iraq war in the back of a Humvee for several weeks at a time. Um, anyone? It's okay if you're wrong. Just shout it out. No one. Okay. Derek Thomas? Anyone? Jack Ruby. I heard it. Jack Ruby. This is more, this is more esoteric. It's Leroy Moore, Dave Matthews Band. Heavy D, I heard it. Someone in the back. That's pretty impressive. Who was that? You want to say who you were? <laughs> Boom. Uh, okay. You're going you're gonna to give away your age on this one. Okay, more, all you guys are old, I guess. Um, even older. Charlie Chapman. So there's a common denominator in all these patients, and the common denominator is that they all died of acute PE. They all died of acute PE. The scenarios were a little bit different on all of them. They all died of this devastating disease called acute pulmonary embolism. It's extremely common. It's often fatal. Um, and the mortality, this is one of the things that we can truly impact mortality, not only by the prompt diagnosis and treatment, but honestly, most impactfully by prophylaxis. Now, this message is clearly heard in the hospitals. We do a really good job. The surgeon's actually better than most of us about preventing DVTs in the hospitalized patient. I should say that PE actually refers to a whole constellation of embolisms that can occur to the lungs. Most commonly, we think of thrombus, typically from a DVT in the lower legs, but this can be from air, you know, from, um, from a broken bone, from, um, they can be from infection even, you know, here in Ohio where the opioid epidemic is so high, we have a lot of endocarditis, vegetations that are infected that actually embolize to the pulmonary arteries. Um, foreign bodies, we've seen, we've seen um, IVC filters embolize. So all these things can cause technically a PE, but for the purposes of this talk, we're talking about uh, thrombus. We're talking about DVT that transitions to become a PE. So this accounts, to, this accounts for 300 to 600,000 deaths per year. This is in the United States. This is one to two per thousand, okay? Um, depending on your age, it's actually one in 100 if you're over the age of 80. The overall 30-day mortality from acute PE is somewhere in the 10 to 30% range. This is really high, guys. This is, there's not too many things in medicine that are this high, actually. We think that... This is hard to get, but we think that sudden death is the presenting symptom in around a quarter of these. These are patients that you probably don't get called about. In fact, these are patients that died of a heart attack. They died of a heart attack. They didn't have an autopsy, but they were probably acute PEs. Um, we know in-hospital mortality is pretty high. Um, and most of these significant PEs that we're talking about, they, they originate in the leg veins. And the reason they're the significant PEs originate in the leg veins is because the leg veins are big. They can hold a lot of clot. And, it's the a lot of clot that causes the, a lot of problem. Um, they can certainly come from arm veins, but they generally don't cause serious clinical sequelae if they originate from the arm veins, but certainly from the leg veins. It's also worth noting that, you know, PE kills four to five times more patients, times, than breast cancer and HIV combined every year, okay? Now, that's impressive. You don't see the yellow ribbon campaigns uh, for PE like you do with breast cancer, right? The NFL days, there's just, the awareness is so much higher for these other diseases. Now, we'll give you that PE encompasses a lot of these breast cancer patients as well, but it's extraordinarily prevalent and probably under-recognized. So, let me bring this back to this audience. You know, what are the exam findings that we're going to find in someone who maybe we go out to the field on with acute PE? Well, chest pain is actually very common. It's a little different often than, say, an acute coronary syndrome and, and myocardial infarction in that it often is pleuritic. It's pleuritic. It, it hurts when you take a deep breath in. This is usually because it's, you've already had some degree of pulmonary infarction. Um, but tachypnea, tachycardia, uh, you can have rolls. You can have deep, decreased breath sounds. You can have elevated jugular venous pressures. Um, syncope is a particularly ominous sign. Um, arrhythmias, non-sustained VT, even AFib, even VT can occur from this, and then sudden cardiac death. I mean, the out-of-hospital arrest could just as, easily be a v, just, just as easily be a PE. The problem for, for you asking me, well, what do I do? How do I find this out? Is I could easily have put this exact same slide in for, for acute myocardial infarction. They overlap so completely because ultimately this is a problem of the heart, really. It's not really a problem of the lungs. It's a problem of the heart. And so the manifestations physically are very similar. 
Um, so what are the ECG findings? Well, they're not super specific like, say, STEMI is for, for an acute myocardial infarction with full thickness injury to the myocardium, but there are some subtle ones. So sinus tachycardia is highlighted because it's by far the most common rhythm that we find someone with PE. But like I said to some of you in my little session downstairs, unfortunately for you, you probably never see a patient who's not in sinus tachycardia. Because if you're standing over me and I'm laying on the floor, I'm gonna be in sinus tachycardia. That's just a fact. But there are some more subtle clues. So in medical school, we all learned about S1, Q3, T3. This is a, and I'll show this on the next slide, this is a kind of a characteristic hallmark of right ventricular strain pattern. So this is what we see. Right bundle branch block that's new or incomplete right bundle branch block is a strain of the right ventricle. So as the right ventricle is strained and starts to dilate out, the right bundle stops, to, stops working as well and so you see right bundle branch. You often can get a rightward access, but really you get some nonspecific stuff too. You get T wave inversions and um, sometimes even ST elevations, non-sustained VT, so all these can happen. So here's a prototypical EKG for a PE. This is sinus tachycardia. It's S1, Q3, T3, in that you have an S wave in one, you have a Q wave in lead three, and you have an inverted T wave in lead three. This is S1, Q3, T3, and this is really just an incomplete right bundle branch block. That's what it is. Um, you even have a PVC or two thrown in here to just show you how angry the heart is. But this is kind of a nonspecific EKG. Uh, so PE is often underdiagnosed. This is the problem, and it's often subtle how it presents. And in my world as a cardiologist, half of my patients come in as heart attacks, even by cardiologists, because the troponins are positive, and they're having chest pain, and their EKG is not totally normal. So they come in um, with this as a diagnosis. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these patients who die, they're just assigned a diagnosis of they died of a heart attack at home. They died of you know, an MI. And, and the reality is it might have been a PE. Um, so when we take care of PE patients, our goals are, are interesting. I mean, our goals are clearly to help patients survive, certainly the ones that are dying. Um, and we want to do this by, you know, unloading the right ventricle, helping to improve their cardiac hemodynamics, reduce the work of the right ventricle, which is clearly failing. And, and even loftily, we, we hope to improve the downstream sequela of this disease, which is what's called chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. A long, long word of saying that, that, that the RV becomes permanently strained and overworked. Uh, the problem with PE is that we have to always find this balance. We have to find this in MI too, but even more so with thrombotic diseases like PE, where we have to use a lot of thrombolysis, is there's always this balance between, you know, clinical benefit and um, bleeding, or causing more problems than we're actually helping, and that's primarily the need of blood transfusions, length of stay, but most catastrophically, the intracranial bleed. So the intracranial bleed is one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome in stroke care, in acute MI when we're not doing primary PCI, but anytime we're using thrombolytics. Now, I'm not gonna put a lot of science here, but I do want you to look at this chart because this is very important. This is why PE is probably the next horizon of cardiovascular care that you're gonna be hearing more and more about at conferences like this. So the patient who comes in with a massive PE, this is a PE, not the size of the clot, this is the, the impact to the patient, this is the hemodynamics. This is the patient in cardiogenic shock. This is the patient on pressors. This is the one who arrested or had syncope or got CPR. You know, very early in their hospital course, they declare themselves. They have a 50, 50% 50 chance of surviving. 50, 50, okay? And then we have this whole other group of patients that we call the non-submassive or the intermediate risk or low risk PEs that if you kind of march them out over three months, 15% of them are dead in three months. To put this into perspective, think about STEMI, right? So what happens when you go to the field, you do an EKG, you see an inferior STEMI, right? You pull a lever, but boom, helicopter's on the air, I'm getting paged or getting a phone call, I'm driving into the hospital, you guys are packing them up, putting them on a chopper, they're all coming in, all these wheels are just greased, the lights are flashing, overhead pages, all this song and dance for a RCA STEMI and a healthy patient who may have a 2% 30-day mortality. Yet here's this other group of patients with a, you know, who were sitting there talking to you, feeling pretty good with a 15% mortality that we're frankly ignoring in many hospitals. This is what we're talking about with PE. So for certainly the, the drop dead, life threatening, I'm dying, I'm on pressors, PE, these patients, if they're not at a hospital that can take care of them, interventionally they should be getting thrombolytics. They should be getting thrombolytics. Every societal guideline recommends this. If you're transporting a patient on pressors with an acute PE, 
they are either should be getting lytics or they're already in the body or they're planned to be given them or they're coming to my cath lab pretty soon. This is the new paradigm for treatment of this kind of pulmonary embolism. Um, and that really is only 4% of the patients. We have this huge swath of patients, about 96% of the others, and of this 96%, probably 40% of those are those with serious clinical impact from the PE, what we consider intermediate risk. And so really brings the question, how do we treat these patients? So much like you help us plot acute coronary syndrome patients on, on this kind of scale of STEMI or non-STEMI or unstable angina or they're looking hot, um, we have to kind of do this with PE also. So it's very easy when they're dying, you're doing CPR, you're getting pressors. That's high risk, they need lytics, they need something done. And it's also very easy when they're in the CT scanner for some other reason and a radiologist gets his little you know, magnifying glass out and sees a little ditzel and that's a very low risk PE. It's not causing any clinical sequela, but there's a huge swath of patients who live in this intermediate range. These are patients with positive enzymes. So it looks like a heart attack. Um, they're technically hemodynamically stable-ish, uh, but they can turn. They have abnormal EKG changes, abnormal echo. We use other scoring systems like the Pulmonary Embolism Severity Index called PESI or Simplified PESI. At Ohio Health in our, in our vascular institute, we've even put this on an app for us to kind of calculate these scores. It kind of brings in other clinical parameters that helps us kind of see these patients because clinically, yeah, they're on two liters, their blood pressure is 120, they're looking good, but what you can't see is their RV's failing. And what you can't see is that in 30 days, you know, 15% of them are going to be dead. That's really hard to swallow. Um, and they, they die for various reasons. They die from recurrent PEs, they die from RV failure. Um, I'm going to skip that. RV strain is probably the most important surrogate marker we look for on the clinical side, whether it's by CAT scan or by echo to show us um, why patients um, are going to have a poor outcome. I'm going to take this time to introduce a concept of PE that's often underrecognized. The patients that die of PE are not dying of hypoxia, okay? This is a dead space ventilation disease primarily. They're dying of cardiogenic shock. So this is my plug as a cardiologist. This is a cardiologist disease. Unfortunately, it's not always perceived that way, but they're not dying of you know, not getting enough oxygen. Although they can, they, they, they die because they have no outflow to the right ventricle because there's nowhere to push it. The lungs are chock full of clot and there's no, there's no flow. And if you can't deliver flow to the lungs, you can't deliver flow to the left ventricle. If you can't deliver flow there, your body starts going into pretty quickly end organ failure. And so it's a, it's a disease of the heart. This is a heart, this is technically is a heart attack. It's just a different kind of heart attack. We already talked about the, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and it's worth noting that when we give lytics, even low-dose lytics, ECOS, you know, the risk is still one to two percent. So two out of a hundred, you know, we take care of at least a hundred um, at our institution every year, are gonna have a head bleed. And that's, that's the price of doing business, unfortunately. It's a devastating complication. Um, in the United States, we have two thrombolytic agents that we can use to take care of things like stroke and PE and MI, and that's alteplase or TPA and tenecteplase or TNK. I would note that tenecteplase is actually only indicated for acute MI, not for PE, although we use it at our institution. It's just because they've never gone for the indication. We do a lot of stuff off-label. It's also worth noting that, um, unfortunately, in this population, there's a lot of things that make it unpalatable to give these patients thrombolytics. And if you remember all the conditions that led to the DVT PE in the first place, that turns out a lot of those are the same contraindications for us treating these patients with TPA or tenecteplase. And that's that they just had surgery last week, or they, they just had a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, whatever the case may be, they've been laid up in bed because they're recovering from their aortic dissection. Um, all of these indications make it difficult to give them lytics, and it turns out about 60% of the patients that we want to give lytics to have some relative or absolute contraindication to doing so. So that makes it kind of a problem for us. You know, how do we treat these patients? How do you treat these patients coming in? Um, believe me, we're just as frustrated when you deliver them to us because our hands are often tied. Um, we have a lot of different options, anticoagulants, we have a lot of different option, options for delivering thrombolytics. Sometimes they need mechanical circulatory support like ECMO or RVADs. Sometimes they do need IBC filters, et cetera. And, and the concept that's kind of developing over the country is something called PERT, or the PE response team. It's kind of like your MI response team or your stroke response team. So this is something that's very multidisciplinary and involves you and involves us. But for patients that we can't just treat the standard cookbook way, give them lytics or give them just anticoagulation, we have other therapies. And that's what I'm gonna spend a few slides talking about. So one of the oldest and um, still fairly uncommonly but 
but, um, but not totally uncommonly used is surgical embolectomy. So um, when we can't give someone thrombolytics and they're dying of cardiogenic shock from a massive PE, um, opening their chest and surgically removing the clot is often a very, very good option in centers with experience and good surgeons that can do this. And when they do this, they often can get very impressive results. Here's an example of a surgeon cutting into the pulmonary artery. And, and this is easy exposure for a cardiac surgeon. I mean, this is kind of bread and butter stuff for them. Yeah, so that resided in their iliac veins probably, you know, a few hours before this patient ended up in the operating room. So, so that's gross, but uh, that's a life saved. Um, for us in the cath lab, um, a commonly used uh, device is something called ECOS. We don't use it a lot at our institution anymore, but it, it uses the philosophy of using ultrasound energy to help break apart these clots in addition to lower dose thrombolytics, and, and it runs on um, little tiny catheters that kind of go up into the pulmonary arteries. It's very, very easy to, pl to place, and it's an option. And then there's the aspiration um, devices like Angiovac, Penumbra, and Flowtriever. I'll talk about Flowtriever because it's kind of where we're evolving to kind of contemporarily. This is, uh, if you were downstairs and you saw our kind of set up, this is kind of a, a long, flexible tube um, that it gives us an option to take care of these patients who can't get thrombolytics. Um, we can actually we can actually do what everyone thought we were doing for the last 20 years, which is taking a catheter up there and sucking it out. And uh, that's never what we were doing. It actually is what we're doing now. And so it's kind of nice. So here's an example of that. Um, I had a lady, uh, this was right before Thanksgiving, I think. She was 63. She had come in with a very rare, it, she, they thought it was a stroke, but it ended up being an acute spinal cord infarct. It had happened two weeks before, and she was treated with TPA. She actually didn't get better, so she left to a, an LTAC um, uh, hemiplegic, but, you know, doing okay. Um, she did have a cardiac workup at the time, and, and she was put on aspirin and Plavix, and, and she went to a rehab center. So she's sitting there at the rehab center. She's talking with her son. She's laughing, and everything was great, and then her eyes just rolled back, and she became completely unresponsive, okay? So this is an ominous presentation, and, and kind of when we hear this story, of course, this is an MI, this is a seizure, maybe she has developed a PE, maybe she's developed, I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause this presentation. She woke up, she lost bowel and bladder, so everyone kind of thinks, oh, it's a seizure. Uh, they, call, they call you guys. Um, you're transferring her in, and she's not really looking that good. You know, her blood pressure is uh, low, it's 72 over 31, she's getting fluids. Um, her pulse is 112, she's breathing fast, and she's on oxygen. So this is easy because this is the PE talk. You already know what this is. But it's not always this easy in the field, right? So she was just in the hospital. She's had catheters. Could this be an infection? Have you had a fever? I don't know. No one can tell me what her temperature has been. But that's kind of the direction the ER went. Eh, she's been in the hospital. She had a Foley in for a long time. She's probably septic. They give her antibiotics. They give her fluids. But they did order a CT scan on her. And this is her CT scan. They actually didn't do it for a PE. They did it to rule out aortic dissection because she had lytics and I don't know. But um, this CT scan, um, although it was done for the wrong reason, was able to capture the diagnosis. And um, as it kind of pans through, there's the RV. It's blown out. And this is the big saddle embolism in the pulmonary artery. So this is clearly a diagnosis. Um, she was transferred to her unit, and um, she wasn't given lytics because they were worried with a recent spinal cord infarct that it's going to make that worse, but unfortunately she just went on to arrest upon arrival, so she got CPR and got intubated, now she's on high-dose pressors. So this is the massive, this is the high-risk PE, this is a patient who's not going to leave the hospital, probably. Um, interestingly, like I told you, this is not so much an oxygenation disease all the time, this is a dead space ventilation disease. She's not requiring a lot of oxygen. She's about 50% oxygen, and she's awake. She's sitting there talking to you. It's really hard to not treat someone who's giving you thumbs up and saying, do, do, do. And this is the lady we were consulted on. I will tell you, this is her initial labs for those of you who are interested in labs. Her LFTs are, are you know, she's in shock liver. Her, she's not making any urine now. Her creatinine's 6.7 from normal. Uh, her troponin's elevated, and her lactate's over 15 or are high. So this is a dead patient, right? This is a patient who's not gonna survive. So we have 
have very limited time to make a decision here. And the decision, like I told you, is she's dying of right-sided ventricular failure. She's not dying, of her, I mean, she's ultimately dying of her PE, but she's dying of all the downstream consequences of her PE. And that in her case, that happens to be RV failure. Um, I needed to support her RV. So the way I chose to support her RV since she was oxygenating okay, because we really have two options. We have ECMO or we have an RP impella. Uh, I chose to go the RP impella route on her. I don't think this video is going to play, so I'm not going to ask to play it, but an RP impella is basically an inline pump that sucks blood, in her case, from the, from the IVC right atrium and ejects it into the pulmonary arteries. Unfortunately, that's not going to work super well with a big PE there. So before I actually do that, I go in um, to the right lung, which is on the left-hand part of the screen. It actually looks okay, but the left lung is stuffed. There's really little perfusion in the left lung, so I use that catheter. This is the catheter I was describing. This is conceptually how it works. So we, we deliver this catheter through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, through the right ventricle, through the pulmonic valve, and into the pulmonary artery. And we actually engage the clot with this end of this catheter. We kind of run it over a wire. That's our train track. We use a very large bore aspiration syringe. Generates a lot of negative vacuum pressure, and then we pop the stopcock in. It, literally just sucks the clot out into the syringe. And this is often how it works. Um, it works sometimes this well. In other cases, especially when the clot's been sitting in their leg veins for a long time and it's more organized and fibrous and what we consider old, um, we have to use um, a, another piece of equipment, uh, these little expandable kind of night and frame discs, which help kind of grab a hold of the clot and train it, they kind of enmesh it. Uh, they agitate it a little bit and they drag it into the catheter. So that's conceptually what this was. Um, and that's a picture of me delivering the sheath. Um, and that's, um, that's me in the cath lab with one of my techs um, pulling the clot out of this patient. Um, and this is what we pulled out. You know, this is this long, used to be in her leg vein clot that caused her a lot of issue. So this is a patient who is still in shock and still doing fairly poorly. But with the impella, she's now getting cardiac output. Her, her right ventricle is decompressing. All of her end organs are now getting oxygenated, perfused blood. I think she required a little bit of dialysis, uh, but she actually came off of dialysis. Her, her vasopressor requirement was off in 48 hours, and she actually got discharged back to rehab. Now, she's still hemiparetic, unfortunately, but she did walk in with a cane to my nurse practitioner's clinic not that long ago, so it was a great save. Um, this is another... Another case demonstrating the importance of early recognition. This is um, one that I actually showed downstairs earlier. But this was a 79-year-old gentleman, healthy guy, no past medical history. He comes in with just severe, severe dyspnea, just cannot get his wind. Um, and so he's been having on and off chest heaviness, and he has a very abnormal EKG. Um, and it was originally um, diagnosed as a possible STEMI. Um, and again, it's not a slam dunk STEMI, but it's it certainly gets my attention as a cardiologist. Um, this, guy's, um, this guy didn't have a CT, but if he had a CT, this is a representative CT of what his would look like. I wanted to show you how, how large these thrombi can get. So this guy in the ER and en route um, was very, very hypotensive. So he's in the full throes of cardiogenic shock, 60 over 40, heart rate's 110. He can't really complete sentences. I mean, you ask him questions, and you, you know the patient that just can't get their air. They can't talk. Um, that's a patient who's living on the cusp. Um, his sats are in the 80s on room air. Um, he's cold. He's clammy. He's in shock, okay? This is a guy that is, his own body is trying so hard to compensate for. His own adrenaline is totally being squeezed, depleted from his adrenal glands. He has nothing more to hold on. He's on a knife's edge, okay? It's, and it became very clear when he we took him to the cath lab that we needed to intubate this guy. But when you intubate patients that are totally, fully compensating as best as they can, you take away their compensation, they crash. Um, you, may have, you may notice this in the, in the ambulance when you have to sedate patients or when you have to intubate patients. When you take away their own compensation by paralyzing them, their blood pressure plummets. This is what happened on him. We knew this was going to happen on him. We were ready. We were ready to put him on ECMO. He got put on ECMO while we were doing CPR on him, so he's dead at this point, getting CPR, full ACLS. Um, once we get him on ECMO, we have completely bypassed his heart and lungs. Those are now out of the picture and we can get to work. Um, we don't know if he's going to be functional or have neurologic recovery. It kind of depends on how good the CPR was and how well he was actually oxygenating during this. Uh, in his case, um, we are able to go in um, with the same device. 
Um, this is yet another patient. Thrombolytics is not super attractive here, primarily because he's been getting very vigorous CPR. Um, and these patients get hemothoraxes and from thrombolytics, they bleed from all their access sites. So this is ideal for a non-thrombolytic approach device. In his case, you can see a lot of clot in both pulmonary arteries. There's not a lot of perfusion to the lungs. Um, we end up sucking out a lot of clot from this guy. He immediately recompensates his right ventricle. He was actually off of pressors in the cath lab. This speaks to the acuity of how he presented. Um, we plan on maybe transitioning him to an RP impeller the next morning, but in fact, his RV has already completely returned to normal function by the next morning. So he gets um, decanalized, he gets extubated, and he goes, he walks out of the hospital home in, in five days. Um, this is a pretty happy patient. I didn't show the pictures, but he sent pictures of himself with his grandkids. It's phenomenal. He's out with his family. This is a guy living, living a life like nothing ever happened. It's fantastic that you know, we all can be part of saving these patients because um, just like the patient that we showed earlier today, um, you know, without the right kind of system, starting with you guys and the right kind of hospital systems, the ERs, these patients really don't have a prayer in most hospitals in the United States. If you have a robust, um, first responder system with a robust ER and, and cath lab and IR lab and surgery, these patients have a chance. So I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon here. Um, anticoagulation still is the mainstay of treatment and even this is an evolving field because the age-old Coumadin is really not where we push patients anymore. It's actually more dangerous to be on Coumadin than Eliquis or Zarelto or Pradax or some of the newer agents. Um, it's less dangerous to your wallet though. But, um, but you know, finding the right diagnosis um, followed by effective anticoagulation is what's going to keep these patients from having the big one. So you might ask, well, what can I, what can I do in the field? So I, I think from you guys, when I get the story, and really what, I've, what I was telling many of you downstairs is, that little bit of the story that you get, right? None of us are getting this because the patient's showing up often in extremis, intubated, unable to complete their sentences, whether it's MI or PE. Um, no one's there to give the story except you. The family's not here yet, they're en route. You know, the patient just got off the helicopter or whatever. Um, what you get in the field is incredibly important. I don't know yet that the patient had a bottle of Coumadin that he was supposed to be taking that he's not taking, right? That's very in impactful for how I treat this patient. Or if you found them laying on the couch and, oh yeah, they just had hip surgery somewhere, you know, they've been recovering, or they've been bed bound, or, or they just got off an airplane from a transcontinental flight. I mean, this is often the kind of stuff that you can get. And when you come in and you prime the ER doctor, or you prime me, it's amazing how different the treatment paradigm will go based on what you tell me. If you come in and tell me the patient was hot and there was a bunch of antibiotics and they've been treating some infection, and I'm probably gonna go on the sepsis pathway. Or if you tell me the patient had severe chest pain and has had lots of stents and a heart attack and you know we're all going once that train leaves the station um, sometimes we eventually get there but you can save a lot of time by really providing a good history um, if you can find out what medications are on you have no idea how useful that is to us uh, on the receiving end um, suggesting this and, and just honestly being humble because I have to be humble a lot of these patients come in as heart attacks I think they're heart attacks and I'm wrong or vice versa I think they're a PE and it actually is a heart attack so um, you know, acute PE is a great, great mimicker of, of a lot of conditions. It mimics pneumonia, it mimics sepsis, it mimics a heart attack. And, and it's one of those things that we're increasingly starting to recognize. We're actually seeing this a lot more than we know, but it's, it's out there. And um, I think for all of us to understand that it's out there and keep it on our differential diagnosis is very useful. So I have a few minutes to take questions. If you have any questions, otherwise I'll stop there. Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, I've had a couple of patients in the last couple of months with presentation of um, hypertension, 240s over like 110. Hypertension? Hypertension. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one patient, female in the 60s, um, had a history of aneurysm and whatnot. Um, tack on the monitor. Respirators were good. Color was good. But a real acute onset, blurred vision, that type of deal. Speech was okay, let's say, but um, I'm up, up out of Cleveland area, out of university, uh, with their protocol for the most part. Um, but I've noticed also in the last few years where 
the uh, use of like polenta and nitro for for use of uh, the acute onset of the pressure. Mm -hmm. My question on that aspect is um, now instead of trying to lower the pressure a bit, I've been hearing that a lot of the attendees whatnot want to keep the pressure at a higher rate. Uh, that may be more the stroke kind of paradigm. That's all to do with cerebral perfusion pressure. So when you make a huge jump in blood pressure, um, a lot of times you don't, especially for patients who've been living at a really high level for, for a long time, their cerebral perfusion pressure increases. And so when you dramatically lower them, then you can actually make them worse. But this is totally different in the aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm, and in my realm. There is no too low, I mean there is too low, but, but, but 220 ain't low enough. Because this is a patient who's visibly symptomatic in front of you, probably largely because of her blood pressure, and the treatment in the field is lower the blood pressure to get them less symptomatic. Also, uh, yeah. my other question about another patient was a male, uh, seven years back, they had an aneurysm, uh, the brain had a shunt placed, yeah. okay. Uh, wife found him at a quarter to eight in the morning with right side uh, weakness, almost paralysis. His speech was okay. Uh, initially, when I was on there for the first five minutes, he knew his name. It was Lord times three. As the call was going, uh, he could only tell me what his name was after that. His speech, which became garbled and mumbled, but his pressure was like 140 over 70. Mm -hmm. Pulse was normal. Respirs were normal. But he was flaccid to the right side, etc. I didn't get a follow-up on that patient. Uh, but um, it seemed like as the call progressed, we took him to Youngstown. Uh, St. Elizabeth's out of the Youngstown, they're level one. For that patient, I, I was just concerned or wondering if uh, the initial onset of that would have been a spike or if he may have had pressure on that aneurysm site, I don't know. That's yeah, it's hard to know. You know, a lot of times, so that's clearly an evolving stroke and you don't know if that's a hemorrhagic stroke, you don't know if that's any, you don't know if you've actually lowered his blood pressure, if his blood pressure is actually too low for him at 140 and that often will manifest either prior strokes will become more uh, will kind of the residual deficits of prior strokes can come to the surface in situations like that but you know I wouldn't be that worried about a 140 I mean really you know that patient needs a CT scan that's what that patient needs and you know you have room on that one yes you showed us on the 12 oh. you showed us on 12 lead EKG that uh, right bundle branch is an indicator of that now what specific leads would we be looking for that and what other changes would be yeah, right bundle branch block is typically best demonstrated in V1 and V2. It's where you see the rabbit ears. And then you see broad S waves in like lead one. You can see it in the lateral leads too. But that's the two places we tend to look at for right bundle branch block. Again, it's, it's not super sensitive. You don't see that and go, ha, PE. Uh, now, if you have the luxury of having an old EKG, which you guys won't usually, unless you can pull up medical records or something, you know, and knowing this is a new finding from two weeks ago, then, then it's of some usefulness. But it's one, unfortunately, PE is it's, it's more subtle. It's not, it's not like I can see, oh, it's STEMI, this is a STEMI, boom. You know, but it is one of those clinical clues. Okay. Would it also be helpful to run a right-sided EKG before? Or is that any? Um, no, not so much. Not so much. Not for PE per se. Not so much. You might see ST elevation in V4R. You might, um, but it's not. Again, it's not sensitive enough. It's not going to dramatically impact their care, um, unless you're ruling out posterior MI or something, and that's still in your differential, which it probably still is. Honestly, um, it might be useful in that regard. But again, the most important thing from the field on PE. Um, because actually, you know, even if you're, even if you're a, a unit that's giving heparin in the field or something, um, heparin is no problem for PE. We're, we're, we're good with heparin on PE. You know, we like heparin. We like heparin for MI. We like it for PE. We don't love it for dissection. We don't like it for a rupturing aneurysm or something. But um, you're not going to hurt a patient with heparin who has a PE, okay? Um, well, what, what we need, and, and for those of you who do critical care transport from a smaller hospital where the diagnosis has already been established to a tertiary care center, I mean, you may be dealing with patients on pressors already who have just gotten lytics. So you, you, you kind of your realm of taking care of these patients is a little different because now you're looking for, um, you know, if, if you're in flight and they blow a pupil while they just got a big, you know, dose of lytics, this is now a patient who had a PE and now has a head bleed. You know, you, now he has two diagnoses. That's not so fun. Um, but, um, but really what we're asking for um, our first responder community is to 
actually just get them get them to us and if you need to support them support them like you would anyone else you know if you have a low blood pressure i mean a patient without a blood pressure or a heartbeat is no good to us we can't do anything we need them we need them to us ideally with a blood pressure and if that requires vasopressors that requires vasopressors i think there's one more question here i don't know what's after me but yeah I work inpatient as a nurse and in oncology. So my biggest thing is when we start to suspect PE, we're looking at, of course, all the strips and everything, but we look at labs too. So a lot of times they ask for D-dimers. Yeah. Sometimes it's a preference, sometimes it's not. And I was always wondering about a BNP. Is it too fast for a BNP to register that there's any sort of failure no, happening? No, a BNP is a, is a fairly nonspecific cardiac biomarker like troponin. So we actually look at BNP and troponin as being fairly useful to help us differentiate this higher, more intermediate risk category of PEs. Um, a D-dimer in a malignancy patient, I think, has very little value because most active malignancy patients are gonna have an elevated D-dimer. Most MIs are gonna have an elevated D-dimer. Most infections are gonna have, so D-dimer, the main use of a D-dimer is its ability to exclude the diagnosis in someone with a fairly low pretest probability, which is a fancy way of saying, I don't think it's probably a PE, they have a swollen leg, let's get a D-dimer, it's negative, it ain't, okay? D-dimer is very, very powerful to take the diagnosis off the table. But if you have a positive D-dimer, yeah, it's not that helpful. They may have a PE, but they may have an MI too, or they may have an infection, or guess what, they have cancer. So it's not that useful in that regard. It's positive predictive value is poor, but it's negative predict predictive value is extremely high. Okay. I guess more on this, maybe, you know, the next year we talk, we'll have made some inroads, but I think, um, the, Stay tuned because this is probably going to be the new frontier uh, because we've all collectively done so well with MI. And don't get me wrong, we have a long way still to go. But um, unfortunately, we're watching a lot of these PE patients die um, when we can actually be taking care of them much more aggressively like we have in the, in the cardiac world. And so um, we appreciate all you guys do for us. And thanks for having me come. It was really, really fun to meet with you and talk to you and um, continue helping you guys get better. It helps me get better. We really work better as a team and we all work together. That's for sure. So thanks a lot.